What is up, you guys? Welcome to Word First Radio, the podcast brought to you by Word First Ministries. I am your host, Jacob O'Neill, and as always, I'm joined by my friends Bailey and yep. Cameron. Hey. And today, we have Mr. Zach Dove in the studio. What's up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing much, man. How are you doing? Doing good. Glad to be here. Zach Dove is one of our double diamond, triple gold star listeners <laughs> on <What>? YouTube. <laughs> you know <this>. He's... <laughs> He's one of them. One of them. That's right. <laughs> the one of them. He's one of our biggest fans. And uh, so we thought we'd invite him in uh, today. But let's go ahead and jump in. Bailey, open us in prayer. Yeah, of course. Lord, we just come to you today thanking you for the opportunity we have to sit with our brother and talk about the ministry that we all share ahead of us. So um, we pray that you would be in this time and that you'd speak through us so that we would be um, encouraging to one another, that we'd teach one another and that we'd gain more of your wisdom for the ministry, again, that we share ahead of us. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bailey. All right, so Zach, uh, we are stoked to have you in today. Mm -hmm. We were to be here. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, We were wondering if you could do us a huge favor, get us started by introducing yourself and tell the good people something about yourself. Yeah. So my name is Zach Dove. Uh, I've been living in Norway for just over nine years now, which seems crazy that it's been that long. Mm. So come originally from the Atlanta, Georgia area, lived there my whole life until we moved to Norway. Mm. So I'm married, Jennifer. Uh, We've been married for 23 years. Wow. Mm. I have two boys. Uh, William is 19. Daniel is 17. Um, And so we love living in Norway. Um, I don't know what else you want to know about me. Uh, I don't find myself all that yeah. interesting. Uh, but we, you know, uh, I, I'm a Sagittarius. Actually, no, I'm not. Oh, my oh, God. God. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> no. Yes. Well, those kinds of things, yeah, for yeah. sure. Why well, would you tell us? I mean, you're a Christian, yes. right? <laughs> Why don't you? <laughs> yes, I am. I'm a Sagittarius. I've got a stack of money on my vision board. <laughs> <laughs> a nice house on That's it. Yeah, no, no, very cool. Uh, why don't you go ahead and just tell us uh, how you uh, met Jesus Christ and made him your Lord and Savior? Yeah. So I grew up in a Christian family. Uh, my parents took me to church all the time, uh, but I never saw the Bible like interacting with our daily life when I was a kid. Like we never read the Bible at home. We never prayed together as a family. And so I think that had an impact on my on my faith at a young age. Um, we would we would go to church. We would uh, we would do all the things that that Christians did, but we never like had that real relationship mm. with, with Christ. And mm. so it wasn't until I was in high school, my parents got really serious about their faith. And then one night, just one of my buddies invited me to go to this thing called Starlight Crusade, which was at Decula High School, which was this high school out in the sticks of Georgia. Mm. And there was a guy near there named Jay Strack, and Jay shared like the real, like true, pure gospel. Wow! Mm-hmm. And uh, and I responded that night, and and my life has been different ever since. Um, I think I realized at that point that like all those stories that I heard in the Bible before, like they were just stories, like they didn't have any meaning. But then, like that night, like once I decided to follow Jesus and make Him the Lord of my life, all those stories like came to life and they had meaning mm. and the Spirit yeah. like testified to those stories in my life. And so it was just a really amazing experience. Hmm. Yeah, very cool. Thank you, Jay. It was Jay, Jay right? Strack. Jay Strack. Thank wow. you, Jay Strack. Uh, so you uh, mentioned uh, in the beginning you've been living in Norway for nine years. Um, I don't want to put this too bluntly, but I will. Why? <laughs> Why do you live in Norway? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I can get as detailed on this uh, as we want, uh, but I'll kind of give you a base level and then we can, we can dig deeper if we want to. Um, I, I visited Norway when I was, uh, a young man in 2009, a buddy mm-hmm. of mine invited me to come. And when he invited me to come, it was for a vision trip for our church. So we were seeing how our church could partner together with Norwegian churches to have kind of a cultural exchange and a gospel exchange. Mm-hmm. Uh, Norwegians going to the U S Americans coming to Norway, And um, I I had nothing spiritual on my radar. I wanted to Mm. come to Norway. My dad had worked in Norway when I was a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My dad uh, worked for a company called Scientific Atlanta, and they did a lot of work with the Norwegian Defense Department. And so I had seen pictures of Norway, you know, all the beautiful fjords and Mm. the wooden boats and the rainbows Mm. and uh, all those things. And so when my my friend Jeff asked me to come to Norway, uh, I said yes. And so being here for, for five or six days, talking with pastors, doing interviews on the street, talking with people, uh, my heart was just really moved for the people of Norway. Um, and then Jennifer and I really began to feel like the Lord was doing something in our lives uh, around the middle of 2010. 
he started speaking and and we were um I'll say I was uh well, I was not obedient at first. Mm-hmm. I was feeling the Lord moving in my life. I was not ready to make a commitment to move to pick up our bags to move us and our two boys to to Europe. Um, but we've never felt a call specifically to Norway. Uh, we've always mm-hmm. felt a call to people that are far from him, secular people far from him. And so we've always said that we felt like our call could be accomplished um, in in Sweden or in Denmark or Seattle, Washington or mm-hmm. Asheville, mm-hmm. North Carolina. Yeah. So our call has always been to, to people that are far from him, secular people. Uh, it just so happens that the Lord is letting us live and work in Norway, and we love living here. We love working alongside Norwegians, and it's been it's been a great nine years so far, and we look forward to, you know, maybe at least nine more. Yeah, <laughs> right. I think some of us can relate to that, at least like in, kind of in the beginning. The, the reason I ask is because easily the number one question that we were asked a thousand times when we told people, hey, we're think we're going to, you know, move to Norway and uh, maybe uh, pursue church planting and missions out there. Then what was the first question people yeah. would ask us? Why, who yeah. are you and why are you talking to me about this? Get off my lawn. <laughs> and then the second question that they would ask us is, why, why yeah, Norway? Why Norway? Yeah. Why Norway? Yeah. Yeah. And so... Uh, is it Norway a Christian country? Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. yeah. And how about, like, it was interesting you said to me... Uh, uh, when you guys were doing things like interviews mm-hmm. and talking to the people here, um, if you like remember back to that time, it was gosh, 2009. I mean, it was a little while ago. Mm-hmm. Um, what were some of the um, things you noticed that really moved your heart um, for, for the people here? I think it was just the general apathy toward the gospel and toward mm-hmm. the things of God. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we would talk to people on the street and we would ask them questions about the, like their spiritual walk or, you know, uh, in general, spirituality in Norway. And they had no clue. Like there was zero thing, like zero on their radar. Mm-hmm. And so talking with pastors and things mm-hmm. like they were, they were really trying a lot of uh, really ingenious things to try to reach people with the gospel. Um, but a lot of them just seemed tired. They seemed yeah. beat down and they needed uh, what we thought at the time, like support or help, uh, which we learned later help is probably not the right word to use in the context of that we're doing ministry in. Mm. Um, but that was kind of our, our impression that they were, that the pastors were tired. The, the parachurch organizations were tired, um, that they needed um, some, some different kinds of partnerships to reach people with the gospel. Mm. But I think people in general, when we would talk to them on the streets and, and it's no different now, um, people are just apathetic to the gospel. Uh, most people you would ask, um, you know, Hey, are you, a, are you a Christian? You might get the answer. Yes, mm-hmm. because they're not, they're not Muslim and they're not Jewish. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they would answer with, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. But what that boils down to is they're Christian because they are a white Lutheran Norwegian. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, they I grew asked, up in a Lutheran church. I uh, asked a young man when we were here, I don't remember which of the couple of missions trips it was, but it was when we were in Bergen. Mm-hmm. And I had a conversation with a young man, and he told me he was a Christian. And so I said, let's talk about that. What, so tell me what you believe about God. He's like, I don't believe in God. That's weird. Mm-hmm. And so I said, well, that's interesting because you just told me you're a Christian. I said, so in an American context, when you say that you're a Christian, like that – that means a whole like bunch of stuff. So when you say I'm a Christian, what does that mean? And he said, "Well, my grandparents are Christian. I'm not Muslim. I'm not. I'm not Jewish. And I was baptized and I right. and did mm-hmm. confirmation. And I'm Norwegian. We're Christian." And so I said something to him like I said, "The way you describe a Christian is like saying that if a cow is born in a in a tree, then it's a bird." Mm-hmm. And he went, "Yeah, yes." <laughs> and that's, and uh, I thought he would think that that was ridiculous, but he kind of just said, "I mean, yeah. That, I mean, that's what that's what we're talking about. Mm. That's what I'm surrounded by. That's who we are. That's some some part of his identity." Mm. But it didn't touch at all. And I think maybe we've said that before. Like we've said we've said about Norwegians that um, when they say they're a Christian, that just doesn't me- mean anything about their spiritual walk. And I think mm. I, I don't want to walk that back, but I do want to be clear about that. The the Christ following biblically faithful disciples that we've met here when they say I'm a Christian mm-hmm. it means all of that stuff mm-hmm. right it means it means that um they desire to emulate the life of Jesus in mm-hmm. every in every way in every sense um mm-hmm. so they mean that but that's not universal it doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. mean that in Norway and and so the the other the other extreme is I'm a Christian what do you mean by that well we're Norwegian we're Christian that's that's what we are. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're in Israel, you're Jewish. If you're in Saudi Arabia, you're Muslim. Right. Something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important, like you said, it, it's important to dig in with those questions and to mm-hmm. ask good clarifying questions and, mm-hmm. and to ask good questions to begin with. Because, you know, are you a Christian here is probably not the best question to yeah. learn if you really want to get <laughs> mm-hmm. to know, yeah. like, their worldview and their spiritual, you know, like, if you're checking their spiritual radar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, even um, like surveys that we've looked up, like we found um, results from surveys where it shows that Norway is totally Christian. Yeah. Um, so we have like organizations that report on the world's like religious status that say that Norway is totally Christian. Yeah, Joshua um, Project has Norway yeah. at 80 something percent. Uh, they say Christian adherent, I think. Mm -hmm. And the percentage of evangelicals way high, way high too. I think IMB has probably better data about that, you know? Yeah, we do have better data. We, and, but it's still ambiguous. Yeah. Uh, you know, because but I, th I do think that like the Church of Norway membership can skew mm -hmm. that data a little mm -hmm. bit. But the best we can figure um, for our IMB data is we're somewhere around 2.1, 2.2%. Mm. I think wow. some Norwegians would rate that a little higher and depending, especially depending on the area of the country you're right. in, mm -hmm. you know, those numbers go as high as, you know, nine or 10% in, in the South of Norway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, uh, I don't want to say like problem, but uh, that, that, um, reality, I'll say mm -hmm. phenomenon maybe, um, has always been really, really interesting to me when I tell people that, well, people say that they're Christians, but it's disconnected from, you know, what it mm -hmm. means to like be a Christian in the biblical sense. Mm -hmm. The first thing that came to like my mom's mind, right. When I first told her about that was, oh yeah, well, I know lots of Christians in the U S who say that they're a Christian and don't live that way. Right. Mm -hmm. But they still believe in God. They still believe in Jesus mm -hmm. and go to church on Sundays, but they just don't live that way. And the clarifying point I always had to make was no, 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 no. I don't even mean that. Yeah. I mean mm -hmm. that. Uh, exactly what you said, like, oh, I say I'm a Christian because I'm a Norwegian or I'm a white, you know, Lutheran. I was baptized and it's mm. uh, totally married to the cultural context. Mm. Yeah, um, and we have the same right. term, right? In the United States, we talk about cultural Christianity mm -hmm. and that just means a different thing. It's just, it's a different phenomenon. I think for me, like it falls into that category of ways where the people here or life here seems the same, but is way different. Mm -hmm. I think Jacob, you put it, that it's like they have the same computers that we do. Like it would be yeah. obvious if we went to a people that looked like we're, if we went to a tribal context when we're living <laughs> in a hut, we're like, okay, everything's different. We expect it to be pretty wildly different. Mm -hmm. We show up to Norway and everyone speaks English and they wear, they shop at H and M <laughs> and there's McDonald's and they have Apple laptops, right? They've got, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. seems more or less like where we're from. And then, and this bit of cultural Christianity, it just is something different. So I think in, in the United States, if I say, if I was to say if somebody they're culturally Christian, I would say that USA still has a bit of sort of a Judeo-Christian moral ethic, and maybe it's it's built into our um, it's built into our culture and our society a little bit. And maybe you bring the family to church, but you not maybe it's like what your mom was thinking. You bring the family mm -hmm. to church from time to time. We're definitely there on Christmas and Easter. Uh, definitely not there on Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> and maybe we're involved in some other stuff. But is, are you living a disciple's life? Maybe not. And so yeah. what I mean is, is something like I, I don't know something like somebody who's a Christian and believes in God, but maybe isn't. Um, uh, deliberately following Jesus with sure. all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's not going on. The cultural Christianity in Norway is, it's so different. Zach, yeah, please jump in and like correct me when I am definitely going to get this wrong. But we've had Christians in Norway for over a thousand years. Yeah. Like it's in the soil here. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. in the atoms and the molecules of this place. Mm -hmm. And so when Norwegians say we're Christian, they're saying something that's at once profound and is connected to like their ancient roots and history in a really important way. Mm -hmm. But it is not necessarily saying anything about what they think about God or Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite uh, philosophers and theologians is a guy named Tom Wolf mm -hmm. from your home state, oh. California. Mm -hmm. So Tom says, and I'm going to get the quote 100% wrong, but he says, wherever there's sustained goodness, wherever there is a um, yeah, sustained goodness, look, look for the lingering fragrance and the smudged fingerprint of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so when I think of that quote, I think mm -hmm. about Norway because yeah. there is... Mm -hmm. It's a good country. It's a yeah. moral country. Mm -hmm. like people live good moral lives, but mm -hmm. the gospel yeah. is not a part of of the average Norwegian's daily life. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like there is there is no adherence to to the Bible, to to the gospel, to to living out biblical mm -hmm. principles. Maybe there is, and they just don't know it. Yeah, but uh, but there's little at, to no adherence. To at that. once they do that, they they yeah they so to to say I think I'm noticing something similar even though we've only been here a short time, is they do that thing that I really love, which is if somebody drops something, they like pick it up and put it somewhere mm -hmm. where you can, like they put it at eye level so that you can see it. Mm -hmm. We're like, whoa, I, I never, I had never thought about doing that in my whole life. You either leave it there or you look around for someone to find it, but you never, you look around for the person, whatever. But yeah. like the idea that I'm going to help, I don't know whose this is, but who, someone's going to come back and look for it. I'm going to make it a little easier to find. Mm -hmm. Or um, I know Alan and I, we've been out several times and we're blown away by 
um, expressions of social trust. So right now we're recording in the public library, which is pretty great. And just outside this door, they have like this whole maker space. And right outside here is like the, the textile thing where you can make clothes. Like they have everything you need to make clothes and do embroidery and all that stuff. But they're like scissors out on the table and expensive equipment just out. Mm-hmm. That's not – it's not chained down. It's not mm-hmm. locked up. Or I was in a hardware store and they have a, a place where you can like pick your own length of chain mm. and have a big pair of bolt cutters. I may have said this one on the podcast before already. But there's like a big pair yeah. of bolt cutters and Alan's like – those would never last in California. They'd be gone. And, and they're not chained to anything. They're just on the shelf next to the stuff. And over and over you see that kind of stuff where it's it's important to them to be honest and to be trustworthy and be excellent people. And they have, as you say, when you have sustained goodness, mm-hmm. I get the sense that there's sustained there's sustained yeah, goodness. A lot here. of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I love I love that quote that the, there's a smudged fingerprint. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a lingering fragrance and there's a smudged fingerprint. And I think that's really beautifully describes, I think. Mm-hmm you know, even my short experience here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want to touch on something um, that you were kind of bringing up like just a second ago. Um, but you said that there's this kind of like general sense of like this apathy towards like maybe some of the more spiritual like mm. questions and stuff like that. And we've been talking about that there's this kind of like a uh, hint or a smudge of a fingerprint or this kind of foundation of Christianity here. That's over a thousand years old. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. Gosh, me and Marissa visited a church from the, I'm pretty sure, 17th century that was, like, burned down. And there's churches like that everywhere. Yeah. And, I mean, some of them are beautiful. Some of them are, uh, like, burned down. And some <laughs> of them are, like, more museums mm-hmm. now. Um, but where do you think um, that, like, apathy, where do you think that comes from? Like, why are they, like, well, I don't, I'm not thinking about spiritual questions mm-hmm. because I'm thinking about what? Yeah, I mean, I think family is very important to the, the typical Norwegian, like mm-hmm. security. And they find that in, in the government. Like mm-hmm. they find that in their in their people. You know, um, Norway's a rich country. You mm-hmm. know, oil was discovered here, what, back in the in the 70s? Something. I think it's and, the most oil-rich geography on the planet. Yeah, it's something like that. So, yeah. so there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of built-in trust in, in the government. Like people, people really do trust mm-hmm. the government. So if mm-hmm. you look at reports and things of, of, you know, especially during COVID times, you know, how much, you know, different people from different countries trust their government, you know, the U S might be, you know, kind of mid, but then you look mm-hmm. at some Eastern European countries and theirs are a lot lower. Uh, Norway's very high in their trust yeah. for mm-hmm. their government. Um, and so I think a lot of it comes from there. Uh, I think a lot of it's a, a heavy dependence on science and, and knowledge. Uh, Norway, you know, ranks consistently one of the most well-educated countries in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's there's a sense of that. Um, one of the one of the things that when I was in the U.S., uh, we we were in the U.S. for for six months before we came back and moved to Oslo. And so when I was talking to people, um, I found what really resonated with with our American listeners uh, and and our American audience. Um, was a quote that uh, a guy named James Emery White used. And James Emery White's the pastor of Mecklenburg Community Church in North Carolina or South Carolina, I can't remember. But he uses a term in his book, um, Rise of the Nuns, not N-U-N, like N-O-N-E. N-O-N-E-S. Uh, and he, so he uses a quote, and he calls uh, those people, he calls them functional atheists. Mm. And I think that term could apply very well to Norway because – the average Norwegian that that I meet, mm-hmm. and it, it's probably a little different than than the average Norwegian that you guys meet, because you are on university campuses. You're meeting a mm-hmm. younger, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, clientele per se than than I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, you might meet more people that would identify as atheists. A lot of the people that I'm meeting that are like 30 to 50 in that range, they wouldn't identify as atheists. Like mm-hmm. if you would really have to dig in and get them to admit, yeah, well, you know, I've never really thought about these things. And so they function in their life and their worldview as though they were an atheist, mm-hmm. but they're not really because they yeah. haven't really had the the time or the um yeah, or the, or I guess the the want to to, yeah. to dig into that and know. Mm. Oh, yeah, I, I think I'm going to be an atheist, or, mm-hmm. or even acknowledge. Well, I'm not an atheist, but I'm an agnostic. Yeah. Um, so I find that term "functional atheist" really helps when you're communicating yeah. with an American audience, and even with Norwegians. Like I've I've had I've used that in a, in a conversation with a Norwegian. They're like, yeah, that that makes sense. That's, yeah, I live as though God's not real. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because it really has no impact on my daily life. Mm-hmm. I remember we were at Skeptics Week. I don't remember if those was the one you guys were. I think maybe it was one that you guys were not at. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we were at the, the University of Oslo campus. And one of the questions was, you know, if God is good, does evil exist? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the, the questions were, uh, yes, God can be good. Yes, there can be evil. But then somebody had come up and made like a, a separate little category in the middle. And they were like, who cares? 
Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Mm. So I think that well. it would would like for me that would portray a typical conversation that I would have with the average Norwegian. Hey, good for you. Like I'm glad you found mm. something that mm. works for you, but it's not for me. But thank thanks for talking to me. It's been yeah. interesting. Mm-hmm. Polite, mm-hmm. to the point, honest. Right. So I find that strangely comforting for some yeah. reason, but also mm-hmm. terribly uh, saddening as well. Yeah. yeah, it's so dissatisfying. It's mm-hmm. like, um, uh, no, you're like, no, man, I'm not hungry. Mm-hmm. It's like, but if you don't eat this, you'll die. I was like, yeah, I, I'm glad you think, I appreciate that you think so. Mm-hmm. And I believe that you believe that. Yeah. I'm but glad just, you're eating. Yeah, like, but just not yeah. just not for me. Mm-hmm. It's like, ah, but, it, but at once, uh, I think that, yeah, I don't really have anything to add except that that you saying that makes uh, uh, makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And definitely our interactions here have been different than the ones that we've had in the United States, mm-hmm. where most people have have more or less decided they've they've chosen they've chosen a hill to defend and a flag to wave, and so they want to argue with you about it. Mm-hmm. And the conversations I've had with people here have been uh, I don't, we've spoken to many dozens of of mm-hmm. uh, Norwegian college students. And they've been kind and wonderful and respectful, and they wanted to know what I like, what I believed. Mm-hmm. Um, that was some uh, some of the deepest conversation I had. Was I said, "Well, you're stand, you're sitting across from like one of these Bible believing Americans. Like, I believe everything in the Bible is true. Mm-hmm. Like you do, or, yeah. What must <laughs> what must you be wondering right now? And they tell me the kinds mm-hmm. of things that they are wondering. Mm-hmm. Um, both are really sort of self reflective, and and they'd say things like. Yeah, I guess I never thought of that. Mm. I go, whoa, mm-hmm. that's so different from what I hear in the United States. Either people will smile and nod until you go away, like try and figure out what it is that I, I can say or do to make you stop and kind of, you know, hem and haw, or, you know, do battle and try and draw blood. Right. And and both of those things, yeah. That's a great question, by the way. Like sitting across, hey, mm-hmm. you have an opportunity to, you know, to use lagas to turn, like to grill a Christian. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I believe everything the Bible says, you know, what do you want to know? Yeah. And so that, I mean, it's, it's really scary to open yourself up that way. I think <laughs> first, but yeah. what an honest, what an honest question. And I think when you, when you do that, when you ask good questions and you open yourself up to be vulnerable uh, in front of people, like it really mm-hmm. does lead yeah. to good conversations yeah. by and large. Yeah. The young man, the first young man I asked that to, he said, I guess my first question would be, why does a smart person believe that? <laughs> You're right. Which is to say nothing of my smartness, but I think to say something of what he thought, you must be like in order to mm. say you believe everything in the Bible. Like we've moved past that. Mm. That's like saying, uh, I don't know, some old sciencey thing. Right? Because <laughs> that's like saying that you believe that the world, the earth is flat or that the, that the earth is at the center of the universe. Like we, we've moved past that. Sure. But here you are, uh, able to like, like speak. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Right. You're not deficient. So how, how could those two things go together? Mm. Which I think is, if, if I can be so bold, I think that is kind of an advantage for the, the work that we have here mm. because knocking down just, it's easy to kick that myth down. So if the myth is Christians or people who believe in God are um, uh, maybe uneducated or I would say ignorant, I, I, but I, I don't even mean that, but like quaint mm. and traditional and just haven't sort of caught up with the rest of the world. Um, I mean, that's a fun one. That's a fun one to knock over and you can talk to intelligent people intelligently. And uh, I think just even having that, that, Hopefully it'd be one of those, uh, like Greg Kokel talks about putting a stone in your shoe, mm. be a stone in the shoe of the typical person who thinks mm. you have to be a dummy and they go, whoa, but wait, wait a minute, this guy, this guy, uh, is, is intelligent ish. <laughs> mm. He's not, he's not, at least he's not in the category of dumbness, um, that I, that I think that religious people have to be in. And maybe that could just bother someone mm. for a while mm. and, and maybe lead to a productive next conversation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I definitely experienced that kind of like charitableness and like kind of openness. Uh, there's a, a question, like the last question on the Laga survey is um, for Skeptics Week and just whenever they do evangelism is, do you have any questions for us? Mm-hmm. And um, I, it, I wasn't always to get able to get to that question because people are in a hurry, but I, th- I can't really uh, remember clearly at least a time when, when I've asked that and they haven't had anything. Mm-hmm. So I've always uh, like asked that question and they always, they'll ask me like one of the questions I just asked them mm-hmm. or they'll bring up like something that they talked like, uh, like a reason they didn't believe in God that mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, I, I can empathize with that. Like I understand. And then they mm-hmm. just straight up asked me and like, well, mm-hmm. you believe in God. You kind of seem like, you know, 
Like, you know how to drive and can count to 10. <laughs> like, you know, like, why do you believe in God? Um, and, but that's nice. That, that charitable spirit is, yeah. is kind of refreshing. Because mm. um, there is kind of like, uh, especially where we're from, I haven't experienced this too much here. Um, I bet you it's here. But definitely where we're from, this kind of like new atheist movement mm. uh, that treats like, like, oh, if you're religious, like your head's not screwed on right or you're like yeah. r- ridiculous or evil yeah. somehow. I don't know if that I haven't experienced that here really. I haven't yet. Yeah. I've, I've I've been a couple of people who've called themselves atheists and but they've still been kind. Mm. And of course, and uh, yeah. and what's interesting is people here want to hear what you have to say. Mm. And I think like I said I think that's an advantage. I also think that that is going to uh, be a struggle for us as Americans because we're not used to those kind of conversations and there's an expectation that this is how we do things. Like if uh, how how um, arrogant would it be for us to enter into a conversation and expect that person to be interested in what we have to say and then for us not to uh, do our part in that. Like we create a little miniature relationship, mm-hmm. right? And we're not just doing battle. We're not mm-hmm. just soldiers for our f- waving our different flags. Mm-hmm. But we enter into this miniature relationship and I think that puts a high burden and expectation, a good one, good burden and expectation on our shoulders mm-hmm. that we would be the same way, that we'd care about what they have to say more than like – all of that to say that I think we have to work hard to be certain that we're not giving the impression that we're manipulating people or right. taking them a place they don't right. want to go. Like, mm-hmm. have you ever been grilled with a line of questioning? I've seen some apologists do this. Mm-hmm. Where you go, well, wouldn't you say it's more likely than not that da 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 da? And you're like, I know you're taking me somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to go that way. And so, <laughs> you're like, well, well, where do you think morality yeah. comes from? What if I, what if I did this really terrible thing right here? How'd you feel about that? They go, okay, mm-hmm. I know you're leading this conversation somewhere and we've lost this thing where you actually care what I think. Yeah. You mm-hmm. want me to give you win. well, you want me to give you the answer you're expecting so that you can take me to the next thing that I that I don't wanna mm-hmm. that next place I don't mm-hmm. want to go. People can smell that from a mile away. Yeah. Know, they see themselves with a the, with a bullseye on them and they see they're being led down a path that they mm-hmm. don't want to go down. And so the conversation's over at that point. And they've yeah. lost mm-hmm. trust in you as a person, but also in in Christ followers in general. Right. Like they've mm-hmm. lost trust. Hey, mm-hmm. you know, you're all about some some rhetoric. You don't really care about me. You don't really love me. You don't really mm-hmm. see me as as the person that I am. And, and we don't want that. Like mm-hmm. uh, us, I think it, we as disciples, like we want people to know that we care and that and that we love them, uh, and not just see them as, as a project or with a bullseye. Of course yeah. we want them to become followers of Christ. Of course we do. Mm. But it comes out of a love and a concern and a care for that person. Yeah, I mean, imagine you're giving away pills that cure death, mm. but the people know that you're getting paid a million dollars each, right? People are still <laughs> going to be skeptical. and be like, no, no, you really should take it. I really believe this really is going to save you from death. But if you get the sense that they that they feel like they're winning or they're getting mm. something for it, yeah. that might, might make people a little mm. resistant. Mm. I a like, lot of resistance. I like that. <laughs> yeah. I really like that analogy. <laughs> you can take that. Put that right in your pocket. But <laughs> I was going to say, I'm, I'm going to write that Totally down. stealing that. <laughs> uh, that kind of gets that gets us uh, really nicely into this kind of next category. Because you've been here for nine years um, and have nine years uh, minus seven months experience ahead of us. Uh, <laughs> what? Uh, how can we or how could a Christian or whatever... Um, evangelize effectively mm. in Norway. We kind of just started talking about it, mm. um, and we've been talking for a couple weeks about um, how people are not projects. And mm. like, I think it was actually in the last uh, no two episodes ago. I said I like cringe inside when I got my first sales job, and someone said to me, "Man, you're going to be awesome at this job. It's just like evangelism." And I yeah. was like, "Yeah, yeah." <laughs> and like, and my heart did that, and I was like, "Ah, oh, come on! Why did you say that to me?" Mm. Because now I'm. All self-conscious about that. Anyways, yeah. so uh, uh, we know that uh, the gospel is not a sales pitch. It mm-hmm. is literally the message of life. It's the most important message anyone could possibly yeah. receive. Um, so I'm just going to put that, you know, big question in your lap. Yeah, well, How can we evangelize effectively I mean, we the Norwegians? We could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. So I don't know how long we have. So maybe We just podcast. want you to tell us the one way okay. that's going to work. Just the most the right effective way. Yeah. Okay, I got that right here. Yeah. You know, let me, Best, right. Uh, how can we make people believe what we believe? <laughs> how can I ask time? for the sale? <laughs> right, that's the right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if I can kind of break it down into, into a couple of different different strategies, if you will. Mm. I don't, I don't love that word strategies, Mm -hmm. but, but if I can break it down, um, you know, if if I'm a coffee guy, like I love coffee and and I kind of think of it as though I'm looking at a coffee filter. So the coffee filters I use are called a a V60. And so it's shaped like a cone. I don't know Um, what that means, but it sounds like you do. uh, Okay. (laughs) So so I know, and there's a listener out there that knows and they're going right now. They're going, Oh yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. 
So, so when we do what we call in, in, uh, with IMB, we call it broad seed sowing. So when we do broad seed sowing, what we're doing is, is trying to get as many people as we can to try to filter down, you know, to, to the people that are interested in having, you know, spiritual conversations. Because, you know, mm. if we go out, let's say you and I meet on a Friday and we go out to the um, Good Unlund mm-hmm. and we talk with 25 people. Maybe of those 25, I mean, on a good day, two or three are really interested in having like a really deep conversation. And so mm. you get two or three people, like you're in it for the afternoon. You're, you're having a deep conversation. And so we let that be our broad seed sowing. Now that can look like a lot of different things. It can look like doing surveys. It can look like just stopping people on the street. But in a mm. Norwegian context, um, if I'm 100% honest, we haven't seen a lot of fruit from just stopping people on the street. Mm. Most of our broad seed sowing has come from existing relationships mm-hmm. and then relationships mm. that we have um, that we can utilize to meet other people's friends. And so it sounds bizarre, but like having a party and inviting friends, but also friends of friends to the parties. So mm, there's a Norwegian mm. term for that. That's like a, a friend of a friend party. Mm. And so we've actually seen a lot of, um, a lot of success. Uh, it's probably not the right word, fruit. but fruit. Yeah, that's yeah. a better word. <laughs> <laughs> so we've seen a lot of fruit from that, uh, mm-hmm. having and meeting people like that. And so using that filter and thinking, okay, which of these 25 people are here do I want to spend my time with? And I think a lot of that comes back to to being you know prepared through prayer, you know, asking the Lord, hey, Lord, lead me to the people that you're already working in their lives. Mm. And I believe that there's, there's power in that, that the Lord leads us to the people that he's already working. Um, but but we 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 use a lot of different you know we'll use teams from the U.S. to come and just mm-hmm. do spiritual surveys with people and so their goal is to find you know maybe the two or three people out of the hundred that they talk to mm-hmm. that they would say okay maybe this is a God prepared person that mm-hmm. the Lord's working on and then they send them to the okay they want we want to connect them with with our Word First family here because you know I'm I'm going back to the U.S. next week you know as, as a you know, a, a short-term team from from California or whatever. But let me connect them with with Cam and, and with Bailey and with Jacob and and Alan and, and the and the ladies, and so they can take them to the next level. Right. So to have those draw up conversations, mm. um, I think that's been somewhat effective. Um, I still don't think that gets us off the hook for doing uh, evangelism, for yeah. going out and mm-hmm. sharing the gospel with people. Um, I think the Lord has called us to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, we just haven't seen a lot of fruit from that, and and, and maybe. You know, we've just yet to to discover or to, to find like exactly the right way to do that. We mm-hmm. have seen some fruit from doing what we call one word surveys. Mm. Um, and so we we just give the people like one word and they have to give us if they have a positive or a negative um entity. Um uh, your response, like feeling, feeling, yeah, positive, feeling, negative, yeah, positive, negative feeling towards, towards it, the, toward that word. And okay. so we use words like government. Right. And so they're telling us positive or negative. And then you start, and then you say Bible, positive or negative. Mm. You say Jesus, church, family, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. Is is neutral an option, or is it just like it's just posi- positive or negative? Oh, okay. Yeah. So we we only get the positive or negative. And so what you're looking, you'll get some people that are just going through the survey, bam, 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 and, and answering the questions. But then yeah. you get the one person out of ten that's you know talking through. Well, mm-hmm. you know, I had a had a great experience w- with church when I was a kid, but you mm-hmm. know, I got hurt or something. Mm-hmm. And then you mm-hmm. can interact with that person. So I think we have seen some some fruit from yeah. broad seed sowing in that in that particular way. And we've had some teams that have done a really good job uh, doing that. But our most fruit has come through through just personal relationships, getting to know our neighbors, mm-hmm. you know, caring for people in the community, finding natural ways to meet, you know, with Norwegians and, and people that, that live here. And that's where we've seen the most fruit, to be mm. honest. Like, we've met people at parties. We've been introduced to people, uh, invited into their lives. And that's where we've seen the most fruit. That's where we've seen people come to faith is through those those relationships and existing relationships. So I can't overemphasize how important relationships are here and that we do spend mm-hmm. time with people. But also, like, not spending time with them uh, just so – you know, we want them to become a believer, but mm. because I, like I said earlier, I think people can, can smell that from a hundred miles away, mm. but spending time with them and, and doing the things that they enjoy, but also like not hiding the fact that you're a believer yeah. and, mm. and that you want them to become a believer too. So right. my wife and I kind of have a, a, a second meeting rule. So by the second time we meet with somebody, they have to know what we're about mm. because by the third time, if we don't tell them what we're about by the third or the fourth time, and then we spring it on them the fifth time, like, Hey, if this is so important to you, why didn't you? Why didn't you yeah, tell me sure. the first time? Like you were trying to hide something, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and so we have we have messed up before, and mm. and, and done that, and, and people are like, uh, you know, feel like a like a project or something. Yeah, I like that that second meeting mm. rule because I mean, if I'm trying to like, uh, just like envision that, like maybe in my life, like mm. maybe I 
meet someone like at a party, right? Or like I got invited to a Super Bowl party like a couple weeks ago. Yeah. So I meet someone at a party and like eventually I'm like, hey, do you want to come over? Like my wife makes like homemade tortillas and we're from California. So you got to try them. Guy comes over, sees like a Bible on our table or a cross on our wall or mm. something like that. And I don't know, it's kind of obvious that like we're Christians and they, they ask us. The first question that I get asked often by believers and unbelievers here is, so why'd you come to Norway? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Boom! I'm yeah. not gonna. I'm not gonna open door. I'm not yeah. gonna through that door, baby. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you exactly why I'm in Norway, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's always opening the door for mm. conversation. I mean, those they even Christians here have, are like interested. Like, what's your story? Why mm. are you drawn to Norway? What school do you go to? Who are you partnering with? Mm. Who who are your, who who do you know? Who are your contacts in Norway? Um, and so, boom! That's just a really easy way. I think, like, as Americans, like, that's a mm, kind of an advantage, yeah, mm. I think, at least we have. Yeah, yeah that's a big, fat gift. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, they because they open the door mm-hmm. on their own. It is. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I There's so much more I want to say, and so I will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you said uh, something really important. Um, you said, I don't think that that lets us off the hook mm. from mm. evangelism. Yeah. Um, uh, I've been asked several times by people in the United States, and I'm sure these guys have as well, and the rest of us have too, but people have been asking the questions like, have you planted the church yet? Is anyone mm-hmm. getting saved out there? Like, how wow. many people have you yeah. evangelized? And um, I'm happy that they're, like, really interested. And um, I, I tell you, I think if there's really anyone who would be like, let's go, like, let's get on Carl Johans like, every day and, like, do surveys or street evangelism, like, that would be me. Like, I want to move like way too fast and like go for it. But I think um, I am now more in love with and more attracted to kind of what you just said where, mm. yeah, we don't forsake that. We don't forsake street evangelism and, no. and preaching, right? Mm. Um, but we don't uh, – what I kind of interpret you as saying is we don't uh, misinterpret that as like the ends in itself. Mm. Um, the ends are, no, we build a relationship with someone. We care about these people. We gain, you know, trust and relational equity with mm. them. And we invite them like at the third or fifth meeting, like to a game night. And yeah. we just hang mm. out and we mm. literally just party and have a great time. And yeah. we invest in people. Um, but they know the gospel. Yeah. They know that we're Christians. We know we we know that we want. They know we want them to become Christians. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not weird because we're actual friends and we're actually in a relationship. When you share your Christian life with people, mm-hmm. you sincerely sh- share your Christian life with people. Mm-hmm. So you don't spring it on them, like Zach said, because that I mean, that makes uh, that make you very suspicious, mm-hmm. right? Right. It's like, whoa, wait a minute, you guys are cr- yeah. We meant to tell you you should join the club. <laughs> whoa, that's not working. Let's doing. just say I didn't do that when I was a banker. It's like uh, by <laughs> right. the second meeting rule, like, hey, by the way, yeah, I'm a banker. <laughs> you want a credit card? No. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, some life insurance. <laughs> some life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I goodness, I've got so many thoughts, and that's all so wonderful. And I think that we are. Um, so blessed to have you and Jen and the boys in town with us. Like that was another amazing thing that God did was bringing them from where they were at. We've mentioned you before. So we've mentioned Zach. This is Zach. Um, (laughs) uh, You've been like a few hours away and now you're in the same town as us, Mm -hmm. which is, which is amazing and awesome. And uh, for lots of reasons, one is you guys are amazing and awesome anyways, but also there's a practical thing. Like you can help us not to, do all the dumb things mm. that we definitely like we're going to <laughs> all the dumb things that I did that you did well, yes, yes. Mm. for sure <laughs> and, I mean we have our own whole crop of dumb things that we're bringing so we're so thankful for for you and your wisdom uh, but I just really appreciate that like mm. like eva- call it street preaching but like evangelism is so important mm. but you know we talked to Todd and Todd said that that people are well, you know we're welcoming people, people into community and in most new believer stories there are like five and some change Christians mm. that have surrounded them with love and an example and like i don't know we, we always from my from my perspective or in my opinion we always want to be clear with people like what we're inviting them to so i'm your friend not just because i want to change your beliefs right but i'm inviting you into this relationship that god's invited me into mm. and we get to have fellowship john says fellowship with one another and with christ and with god the father which is kind of the like literally the best thing that could possibly happen and so um, so why wouldn't we be honest and clear about that from the beginning? And I think that if it's done wisely, let me think about how I want to say this. Mm-hmm. Say that it's low pressure. It shouldn't ever be low pressure. It should be like high urgency, mm. but no sense that we're friends because you want me to be a Christian. And if that is off the table or if um, 
if that looks like it's uh, if it looks like that's not going to pan out, then you're not interested in me or something. Mm. And yeah. I, I I remember Zach, we talked about this. You brought it up, I think, um, uh, when when Jim and Joel were over for dinner, but about reading the story of the rich young ruler in Norwegian. Mm. And I mm-hmm. said that Jesus looked on him with compassion. So Jesus loved him and looked on him with compassion. When he walked away, like it broke Jesus' heart. He told mm-hmm. him, the young man said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Like, how can I join you in the kingdom? And he told him the one thing, and the young man wanted both. Mm-hmm. And so he walked away. And it doesn't say that Jesus moved on or that Jesus was like, okay, well, I guess this wasn't a God-prepared person. Mm-hmm. Or it's like... His heart broke because he actually sincerely loved mm. loved that man who was mm. unwilling to do not only was yeah. it in his best interest but was unwilling to join the God of the universe and mm. family forever. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things you just said was really good, and it's something that we talked about. Uh, Cam and I were together on a on a trip uh, recently, yeah, recently, <laughs> and uh, and one of the things that we heard was that as believers, like in in engaging with other with non believers in their lives, like we need to have a long term perspective but a short-term urgency. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I really liked that. And so I kind of wrote it down and mm. thought, you know, maybe I'll get that tattooed on me somewhere. <laughs> like, I like that, like long-term perspective, short-term urgency. Yeah. Maybe I'll get somebody to design that. Yeah. Like, that get on like each cool. of your hands. Yeah. <laughs> on your knuckles. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. You know, That's a pretty cool short-term. tattoo, yeah. by the so, way. Yeah. But I, I, think, I think you're 100% right. Like, you know, thinking through the, the narratives and, and, the thing, and the stories from the New Testament, you know, mm. even like I was talking with um, – we had a, a youth group come over yesterday, and one of the things that I wanted to talk to them about, and we ended up not getting time to do it, and I was really disappointed, mm. um, was going over the the Good Samaritan, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know, and how the Good Samaritan, like it didn't begin like he didn't know the guy laying on the side of the road, right? Like he didn't he didn't love him, mm-hmm. but he had compassion for him, he mm-hmm. cared for him because he's a fellow human being. Like yeah. he didn't know his situation, he just knew he was a guy that had gotten beat up and laying on the side of the road, and so, like it should break our hearts. Mm-hmm. Like it talks so many times in the scripture about like Jesus is like weeping and like crying over Jerusalem and like breaking his heart for, mm-hmm. for the people that are, that are far from him. And so I think part of our, part of our task and urgency and evangelism is begin, has to begin with like a love for the people. Yeah. And like, we're sinners, man. Like we're, we're dirty, filthy sinners. <laughs> and so like loving people doesn't come naturally to us yeah. most mm-hmm. of the time. Right. So we have to dig in and ask, you know, the Lord, like, hey, can you can you help me to love people that see the world very differently than I do? Yeah. Can you help me to love them the way that you love them? Yeah. We were talking about just that concept in general not very long ago. There's a Switchfoot song that I really uh-huh. love. It's called Easier Than Love. Yeah. Um, and I could just imagine, John, if this is true, let me know. But uh, <laughs> Maybe it's John Foreman. Yeah, John, John Foreman first, first name is, is watching. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Um, I'm impressed. But I could imagine, right? <laughs> I could imagine. I, I said hi to him when he was backstage once and he waved back. So yeah. that was nice. Basically uh, BFS. Basically <laughs> BFS. Uh, the song is called Easier Than Love. I could imagine uh, just like him sitting down, like thinking up like that song and the mm. concept for the song is like, man, love is hard mm. to do. Love can get uh like there's all this like people are hard to love mm. people suck and right you, like you said they're dirty filthy sinners and to choose to put them before yourself mm. and to do all the things that like first corinthians 13 right says that love is to do all the things be patient kind mm. uh it d- doesn't seek after its own needs rejoicing in the truth mm-hmm. putting all of those things and directing all of those things towards people who not just let you down, mm. but sin can sin against you and hurt mm. you. Uh, man, love is hard, and the yeah. song is about all that. Man, it's easier to uh, to hate somebody or to just not love someone but lust after someone. It's mm. easier to just live your life for money or live your life for yourself. It is. It's difficult to love, mm. um, and I love. I just. Love, no pun intended, <laughs> yeah. that concept that everything you were talking about. I'm going to have to go home and listen to this song. Now. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's really good. Mm. I just want to add, um, it's really, uh, I can't think of a word that's not lame, like affirming, I don't know, <laughs> comforting. <laughs> like, uh, Those aren't lame. I think yeah. it's really spiritual, Bailey. <laughs> like settling, hearing you talk about what kinds of ministry are effective out here. Yeah. Um, since you have, you know, nine years of being literally in our shoes, like, mm. Americans moved up and out to Norway. Um, so it's really like settling to hear that that's what, uh, like relational mm. ministry and, um, ministry over time, building trust and friendships mm. with people is the fruitful and effective 
um, route that you've found mm. thus far. Um, because we definitely have the itch and like the weight of there, you know, there are 5 million people out here mm. who need to know the gospel. Um, and in one sense, we have that urgency heavy on our shoulders mm. and we want to do the thing to, you know, get all the 5 million as fast as possible. And, um, tons of people listening to the podcast, everyone at home that we talk to, mm-hmm. like Jake said, they want to, you know, that's the exciting missional stuff yeah. that you hear. People mm-hmm. getting saved out there. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's the exciting, like when you think missionary, you think people are getting saved and mm-hmm. converted in a place where a ton of people need to get saved. But yeah, um, yeah it's like settling, comforting mm-hmm. to know that just um, we have to keep our eyes focused on the fruitful work mm-hmm. and we can't um, let the urgency and the like, the it's just to have the satisfaction of, yeah, uh, we saved 10 people this week. So mm. like right. to be able to tell that to people back home would be awesome. But we want to create uh, mm-hmm. genuine disciples mm-hmm. and not just genuine disciples, but genuine disciples that create more of themselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that is absolutely going to take mm. our time and friendships and trust that we mm. build with them. I think you guys are so wise in building that firm base and, and building your learning the language, learning culture, learning those things. But uh, yeah, see, I think that's that's really, really wise the way you guys are doing things and not coming in as the, you know, with the American savior mentality. Yeah, that, you right. know, we have all mm. the answers. Listen to us. We'll get it done. Um, mm. Because it, it doesn't work. You know, well, we've I've, seen, yeah, we've yeah. talked mm-hmm. with Norwegians, you know, over the years that have seen people come in with that mentality. And, you know, most of the time they're gone. They end up working alone. They don't have a lot of partnerships with Norwegians. And, you know we're all here on temporary work visas, right? Mm-hmm. Because student, mm-hmm. temporary yeah. student right. visas. We can right. have to leave Even at more any, temporary. Yeah. any <laughs> possible time. We could, yeah. have to, we could have to go. And so building those relationships with people that can't get kicked out of their own country mm-hmm. like, is yeah. so important. Yeah. So I think you guys are really wise and, and smart in the way you're yeah. doing these things. We're not even wise. We just learned it from you. And yeah. <laughs> so Cam's well, Facebook. Maybe you're wise like, to don't listen to me. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I love it. Uh, do you mind if we switch gears real quick? It, not too far, um, but since we've been talking about relationship and evangelism, mm-hmm. and, and instead, I want. I loved when you said, "Hey, we uh, got ten people saved this mm-hmm. week." I see that phone call. Uh, the, a successful phone call in our context would be: I evangelized ten people this week, mm-hmm. and three of them I'm going to coffee with, and yeah. here are their name. Here are all ten people's names. Mm-hmm. I'm going to coffee with three of them, and now I'm building a relationship with them. One of them's coming to a game night, and, and yeah. mm-hmm. it's uh, it's playing the long game. And I see mm-hmm. that is like, listen, if we, gosh, if if only one of us or like us as a team could do that, like in a week, that'd be mm-hmm. a super successful evangel- evangelical week. Right. Yeah. But since we're talking about community, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we did an interview with a guy named Todd Moore on this kind of uh, church planting model like called Missional Community. Mm-hmm. And we did, uh, two episodes ago, we did a look back on that where we got the chance to talk about some of our takeaways from that kind of church planting model. Mm-hmm. Um, real quick, Bailey, I know this is your favorite thing. <laughs> Can you just mm-hmm. describe, it just in like two, three sentences, a Missional Community real quick, just so it's on the table for this episode? Uh a missional community is a group of believers who uh, intentionally live missional lives um, and befriend uh, unbelievers and surround those unbelievers with community. Mm. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, I need to, I need to clean it up. Tell no, I like it more clean way. But and so that's a church three model. Pillars. That is a church model that we are. Uh, very attracted to we we we're, we're convinced that that um, has the potential to bear some fruit. Mm. Uh, what are your initial reactions to that, and some of your takeaways, like from what Bailey just talked about? Um, do you think that that model could work here? Are we just nuts? What 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 do you think? No, I think a hundred percent it could work, and we've seen you know we've seen things like this work. You know, we've never really called it missional community the mm-hmm. things that we do, sure. but we we believe in leading missional lives, and that involves inviting people into every aspect of our lives. So yeah. if we're yeah. having a a fight at home, if the house isn't clean, but somebody wants to come over, like we still let them come over, and they walk mm-hmm. through those things with us, and so that's. It's really difficult. It's mm. uncomfortable as a believer because, like, we want people to think that we have our act together, mm. right? Like, we want people to think that we're, like, that mm-hmm. we're good. Like, Too blessed to be stressed. Yeah, exactly. 
So yeah. like we want people to, <laughs> to so think good. that, like we want people to think that, but when we invite people in to living like a missional life and we mm. open our door to let people, you know, I can't count how many times when we lived in Sondiff Yard, we lived in an old house upstairs. We can't count the number of times we would come home and there would be somebody just sitting in our house. One of our friends, you know, the, oh, I was in town and needed a cup of tea and thought I'd stop by your house or needed a coffee, mm. stop by your house. We're there, have questions, you know, wanted to, wanted to follow up. Um, I think it's a really, really great idea. And when we moved here nine years ago, I remember riding in the car uh, from the airport to our Airbnb and asking, I said, hey, I feel like this is the kind of the vision and the, and the direction that the Lord has given us. You know, small group, very intimate, like being missionally minded. And uh, nah, probably won't work here. It's too, mm-hmm. it's too intimate. It's too, uh, it's too much for, for the average, you know, Jan Norwegian. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's too aver- too intimate for him. But we've seen it work a hundred times. Mm-hmm. We've seen it work. We've seen people invited into our lives. We've we've shared our life with them. We shared countless meals, countless coffees, mm-hmm. um, just having them in our lives. And so I think it, I think it can really work. I think there's definitely challenges to to this church planting model. I, I see like some some things that you guys would have to be super aware of yeah. in this in this context. And Cam, we've talked about some of some of the things. Yeah, I'm sure you know, we'll discover new ones. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, exactly. So I, I think. It's um I think it's a great a great model going forward because for for secular people that that are far from the Lord like they're not you know they may never step into a church building you know mm-hmm. I had a, a chat with a with a guy last night that, that you guys kind of brought into the to the scene for us and you know we were we were talking about about church and the Lord and he just said never never been to a church before. Mm-hmm. never been not in, not one time in my life and so as an american from the south like that just doesn't compute for me <laughs> mm-hmm. it doesn't commute and compute and so the idea of inviting somebody like that into a relationship that that doesn't you know that everything doesn't revolve around a church building mm-hmm. right? right everything doesn't happen inside those four walls of the church mm-hmm. but rather overflows into the community mm-hmm. and we're loving and, and yeah. serving jesus in the community but also teaching people what it means to be a disciple. Yeah. You know, because if we believe like that we want to be disciples who make disciples, like we kind of have to know what a disciple is ourselves. Mm. Like we have to know what that is. And so like looking at verses like Second Timothy two two, you know, the things that you've taught me in the present the things that I've taught you in the presence mm. of many witnesses, mm-hmm. be faithful to entrust these things to other people who can entrust them to others. Mm. And so like that's I mean, that's important in our lives. Mm. And I think that's a huge asset to living a missionally, you know, minded life and living in missional community. Yeah. And I love, like Jake said, we're going for the long game. Mm. Um, Like we're going for the even longer long game, which is um, (laughs) (laughs) that we're entrusting this ministry to Mm. others. Like the, the part that I get really excited about and the most beautiful part of our vision and plan and all of that um, is imagining three guys that we don't know at this point in our lives, like three Norwegians sitting around this table mm. and us, you know, being behind cameras or whatever, like replacing ourselves mm. in Amen. all the stuff that we're doing, all the uh, ministry we're doing from the top to the bottom and having missional communities that are born out of mm. um, people that already, like you were talking about how um, most of the, effect of like reaching new people comes from uh friends and friends of friends and like let's just get norwegians who have grown up here have their whole list of uh contacts in their phone mm. are viable friends um and just yeah i that's what i'm so excited <laughs> about that's yeah. what like whenever uh or when you and i were first having these sorts of conversations back in the u.s that's the stuff that like gets my heart mm. pumping Yeah, is the thought of um, not us doing this stuff, like mm. not us coming out here to be a missional community and welcome Christians or welcome Norwegians to it for us to um, launch Norwegians into their own missional mm. communities. Yeah. <sighs> that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's so Zach, you talked before about avoiding the American savior thing. And I've, I've been surprised to hear how many of our Norwegian sort of Christian church leaders have told me they've witnessed that. Like we've mm. seen the Americans come mm. in and do and say some stuff and they are not here anymore. Mm. Um, right. This, if what we're doing is coming in to, to do the, th- like bringing American religion to Norway or something, 
uh, like bringing KFC to Norway. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> please bring KFC. To yeah, yeah. yeah. that, that one we can, Yeah, that would be we'll okay. make an exception with that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But like, it's not that we're bringing an American brand. <laughs> American brand to Norway to mm. be run by Americans or something like that. We want to see people's hearts, yeah. um, their lives changed and their hearts renewed mm. and replaced and them live eternal lives in the mm. presence of God. So, yeah. if and we have, we're like bearers of the gift mm. that can make that, make that happen. But then like the expectation that we then are the ones doing the religion. I don't know how to say it. I was say running the church, but mm. I don't even mean that. But I mean, like we're the ones overseeing the cult of American religiosity mm. or something. Mm. It's just kind of gross. Mm. And that's why I, I really appreciate it in the IMB. Like our, we have all the, the missional task mm. and the first, the first phase, that's not really a phase, but sort of the first call it a phase is entry. And the last one is you exit into partnership. Mm. And mm. so, uh, which is what you see, Paul doing all over the mm. all over that part of the world in the first <laughs> century, right? It's, mm. The idea that we want people's people's eternities to be secured, and then how they can be most effective in loving their community and witnessing to them and living out the gospel there. How how could I possibly tell Norwegians how to do that? Mm. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. So if we can earn enough trust and relational equity mm. that um, that lives end up being changed because hearts are softened to and receptive of the gospel. Yeah. Um, then it just makes all the sense in the world. I mean, obviously practically, because we our visas literally have an expiration date. Mm. Um, but also practically, because who who knows those people more than those people? I mean, I mm-hmm. remember when we were talking initially about being going on mission in Norway. It's like, well, imagine if a handful of Saudi Arabian students showed up on our college campus and said, "All right, everyone should be Muslims now." I go, whoa, mm-hmm. what are you doing? Like, mm-hmm. you, you don't know anything about us or our culture or where you're at or what. And so we have to, mm-hmm. I think, constantly be looking for blind spots and seeing mm-hmm. ourselves and uh, trying, to, trying to have an outside perspective of what it is mm-hmm. that we're here doing. And what we're doing is showing beggars, like, how to, where to get bread, mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. And, uh, how and they, then entrusting the bread making to them. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe it's so Billy Graham, right, famously said that we're beggars telling other bre- beggars where to get bread. But maybe something like we have the bread recipe <laughs> mm-hmm. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, and we, we're going to take all of us to make mm-hmm. all the bread. Yeah, and, You know, if we think of our end game as being like that we want to entrust stewardship of, of we, whether we call it the missionary task, whether we call it the gospel, if we yeah. want to entrust that to Norwegians. Mm-hmm. But we recognize that we're stewards ourselves of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't belong to us. It's not mm-hmm. ours. Like it's it's God's mission. It's God's heart through Christ. And so like if we want to entrust that to Norwegians, if that's our end goal mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. to entrust that to Norwegians, then it changes the way we work a little yeah. bit. Right? Yeah, and it so. changes it and then it involves, you know, sacrifice, but it also involves, you know, painful communication at times mm-hmm. that involves, you know, doing things that maybe, maybe we think, okay, I don't see why this is working, but I'm trusting you as someone that lives here to help me understand why yeah. I should do it this way, as opposed to the way that, that my culture does it. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times we can ask questions, you know, from an outside culture, Hey, why, why are you doing it this way? Or, you know, and so it helps us to understand, you know, we're not looking to to develop American culture here, just like you guys mm, have said. Yeah. Like we don't want to import American culture here. Norway except is, KFC. We except said right? KFC. One hundred percent KFC. <laughs> this episode um, brought to you by KFC. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but like we we want um, we don't want to import the American culture, but we also want like Norwegians to understand that yeah, there there are things about their culture and their Christianity that just like ours, like maybe don't line up with a kingdom-minded, mm-hmm. you know, disciple mm-hmm. of Christ. And so like, how do we develop this, not American, not Norwegian, but a kingdom culture right. yeah. and, mm-hmm. and see that? Because I think that's when, you know, people are going to, oh yeah, I want to, I want to get invited into that. Like yeah. they don't necessarily want to get invited into American culture. Maybe, maybe mm-hmm. some things about us they like, yeah. but maybe some things they don't. Yeah. And to, to your point, I mean, we could fall off the other side of the horse and try and become Norwegian. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, 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 the point is not that we want to necessarily, maybe we can redeem parts of the culture, but mm-hmm. the point is not show up and make Americans or show up and pretend to be Norwegians. It's right. we hold everything mm-hmm. up to the light of the truth of scripture and submit everything to that. Mm-hmm. So we can see as Americans with our own cultural baggage, what of that we need to jettison and change in order to um, be faithful disciples. Mm. And then if if that's our goal, then even with the locals, we can do the same thing, right? Mm. So so we don't say, okay, so we'll become Norwegian, we'll do everything like you guys do, or expect you to do things like us. It's no, no, no. We all as community, all as all as humanity, all as a race created to be family of God, 
we submit all of those things to um, uh, submit all of those things to God's wisdom mm. and uh, and the light of Scripture, mm. something like that. Yeah, thank you for saying that much better than I did. <laughs> oh, no, not a good chance. <laughs> At least equally as good, <laughs> uh, Zach. We really appreciate you coming yeah, on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, mm-hmm. Wrap up for today, uh, but we do have one more uh, uh, really. A difficult question, a deep philosophical question mm, okay. to ask you uh, right at the very end. Uh, what can uh, our family back at home and church family back at home and just anyone who's watching this in in 50 years from now, what can we be <laughs> praying for you? Oh, man. What do you? What do you need prayer for? Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a prideful guy, mm-hmm. um, and my pride manifests itself in my life in lots of different ways. So pray that I would wake up each and every day and turn over all the things that I think I'm good at, all the things that I think uh, I I can accomplish on my own, turn those over to the Lord Mm -hmm. and just have that abiding relationship with Christ. And pray, pray the same for for my wife. Uh, not that she's prideful at all, but uh, <laughs> right. but and for my boys, like they've they've grown up in this culture. Um, they didn't have very many Christian friends. At, well, I will say they had no Christian friends at their school mm-hmm. in our past city. Um, and so we're we're just a few months into living here, and we're already seeing opportunities for them to get mm. plugged into ministry and to develop Christian friends. So. Um, I think even, you know, if, if you're watching this next month or 50 years down the road, like pray for my kids because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah, they didn't, they didn't sign up for this. Right. Like right. we, we brought them along and and they didn't sign up for this. And so mm-hmm. just pray for their hearts and their minds just for protection and for mm-hmm. um, just that abiding relationship with Christ. Yeah, both, of both of my boys are walking with Jesus. And mm-hmm. so um, I'm so utterly thankful for that each and every day. Yeah. They're awesome. They're awesome people. So uh, awesome. Well, uh, once again, thank you. Uh, mm-hmm. And everyone watching, thank you so much for uh, tuning in to hear. Well, everyone listening, uh, too. Thanks for tuning in however you did that. <laughs> Not just the watch. I think we should thank all the people. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. Whatever, however you're getting it into. However you're getting into you. Everyone Ooh. experiencing. You're just everyone saying that because <laughs> I like to watch. That's right. Everyone experiencing. Oh, that's so good. That's right. Anyone experiencing this, thank you so much for <laughs> tuning in to experience yeah. uh, the Word First Radio experience. We will see you again next week. God bless. Thank you for watching this episode of Word First Radio. If you like the podcast, please like, share, and subscribe. If you want to learn more about Word First and how you can support the ministry spiritually and financially, check out the links in the description below. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Word First Radio, and we'll see you again next week. God bless. God bless.